reports now that she but authorities are asking everyone to stay inside at this hour Let's pray. Father, we are here in your presence this morning. We, we prayed earlier today, excited knowing that you are the God who saves, you are the God who surrounds, you are the God who, and we even prayed that you are the God who chastises. But at the end of the day, God, you are the God who will be with us in the end that we will dwell in your house, we will dwell in your presence, we will live by your light, and for that, we can be excited. So as we go into this message, let your words be heard. In Jesus' name, amen. So good morning, church. Exciting to be up here with all of you uh, as we are diving into the book of Revelation. Uh, For those of you who know me, I love the book of Revelation. It is one of my favorite books. I always joke about, you know, we, we, we learn about Revelation, and folks are sometimes intimidated by the book of Revelation. It's a mysterious book. There's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of things that we don't really understand, a lot of numbers, a lot of names, places. But at the end of the day, the thing to remember is that we win. Let me, let me try that again. So I just we just prayed, right, that God is the God whom the, the light, we will dwell in his light. We won't need a sun. We won't need a moon. We won't need fluorescent light bulbs. No need for worries about CFLs and mercury in the air if they break because we will live by the light of God. There'll be no more suffering, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more sadness, no sorrow, no loss, no limitation, because we will dwell with our God and we will be his people. So even as you see a video where the waters turn to blood, and it does say that, and even though it talks about uh, people wanting the very mountains to fall down on top of them in fear of the Lamb, For those who are in Christ, it is a day that we will be victorious. We will be victorious. And we will be victorious for all time, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So there's your intro to Revelation. That is the the book of Revelation, the thing that you need to take away from that book. Remember, your Bible is set up that there's, you know, 66 books in the Bible. There are, you know, over or there are 40 different authors that are there. The Old Testament is, hey, Christ is coming. The New Testament is Christ is here. And at the end of the New Testament is I am coming again soon. Amen. That is your primer for what we know. Now, the work is to get in there and read it through and understand it. Learn it. Get it inside of you so that you can share and tell people what God has done and what he is doing. Because as Pastor Paul mentioned last week, we all work good, work well, work best under deadlines. If I if I well, okay, maybe not you guys. You guys are all perfect. You got your times, you know, your your schedules listed out and everything works for you. For Carlton, I have a hard time unless I know, hey, this is due coming up on Friday or it's due tomorrow or it's due in the next 10 minutes. No matter what it is, I work best when I know there's a deadline coming. And that is what Revelation really gives you. It is a book of deadlines. It is letting you know that God is coming again soon. It's a reminder to help us make the right decisions. It's a reminder so that we can get our our, our actions, our activities on track. It's a reminder that we don't have to worry because God is going to take care of us. And even in moments of doubt, 
even in moments of confusion, even in moments of fear in, in anxiety and stress and pain, God is still doing something. He's on the throne and he is orchestrating the victory for his children. Our flagship scripture for this is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter one, verse eight. And it says, I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty. The alpha, the beginning, Genesis. The omega, the end, Revelation. The one who was in a time when we weren't even being thought about. The one who is in this very moment where we are right now. And the one who is to come. He is coming again soon. Where Pastor Paul left off last week in Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And that is what we need to have on our lips every day. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing a song that says the same thing. It says it over and over again. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In the traffic as I'm going to work, come, Lord Jesus, come. When my relationships don't seem to be going the way I want them, come, Lord Jesus, come. When my children don't listen, come, Lord Jesus, come. When I don't feel respect from my peers, come, Lord Jesus, come. When Christianity begins and starts to seem like it's being marginalized in the culture, come, Lord Jesus, come. When I don't know what to say next, come, Lord Jesus, come. I like to repeat things because for me, that's how I get it inside. I say things over and over and over again to myself to remind me that God is coming. He's coming again soon, and we need to remember that. And I know as we are diving into Revelation, we get a little nervous. Sometimes we worry about the dragon. No, no, nobody ever worried about the dragon. I, okay, when I was a kid, I worried about the dragon, okay? I love, you know, things like the Lord of the Rings and, and, and those types of books, right? I've read, I, I read those things when I was a kid, when I was a little kid. I remember I was so excited when my daughter said she wanted to read The Hobbit because it was the same age that I read it the first time, and it was really exciting, and I remember the dragon, the dragon that breathed fire over everything and things turned to ash and people were burned away and buildings were destroyed. I feared the dragon. So when you have a, a book like Revelation and it mentions a dragon and he's there, he was the most powerful creature that there was. There was a very small margin of uh, a chance that you could defeat the dragon. But in Revelation, it talks about a lamb who was slain. And it talks about angels who took the dragon, chained him, and threw him into the fire at the name of the Lamb. Because of who God is, the dragon was destroyed. So there was something greater than what I feared most of all. And that brings us to our first underline. The thing to remember, and what we'll be talking about today, is the return Christ is coming again. And that should bring joy and peace and excitement to our lives because he is coming again soon. He is coming again soon. I don't have to be nervous coming up here and preaching on a Sunday morning because he is coming again soon. And no matter how he speaks through me, it will pale in comparison to when he speaks. He is coming again soon. In the early church, they had a greeting, and I don't know if you may have heard this word before. You may not. It may be the first time, but the word is Maranatha. And it means our Lord comes. And that was a greeting that the early church had one to the other. When they would see each other, they'd say, Maranatha, our Lord comes, our Lord comes, constantly reminding themselves that God is coming quickly. It was such a concern that 
you know, folks were, you know, it was like, he's coming. He's coming again soon. We've got to do the things he called us to do because he's coming again soon. John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He left to prepare a place, and they knew it. Okay, so remember, the early church, there were hundreds of people who saw the resurrected Christ. And he said, I am going to prepare a place for you with the promise that if I go to prepare a place, I am coming back. So I give that to you this morning. He left to prepare a place for you. And he is coming back for you. He is not going to leave you behind. But you've got to know him, and he has to be your Lord. It was such a worry during that day that the the Thessalonian church, they were so concerned about that Jesus was coming any minute now, tomorrow, next Tuesday, Christ is going to return. But what do we do about people who have died? What's going to happen? What about them, those folks that died? We talked about this during uh, q and A. I I think we talked about this. We talked about when we were in Revelation, we were talking about all the theology around it. And we went to Thessalonians chapter 4, 14, and it said, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Those are the, God, the words of God to the Thessalonian church letting them know not to be concerned about those who have died in Christ. For in all honesty, their reward is already met because they've left time and now they are at the end. We are still riding this thing out. Don't worry about them. They may have fallen asleep in him, but they are with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They are with him, and they will return with him in that day. God spoke. God whispers. The trumpet sounds. Michael, the archangel, cries out. The greatest victory of all time will come with the greatest shout. The shout of the multitudes who have died in Christ. The martyrs who died for the cause of Christ. Those who lived their lives out for Christ and quietly went to to their graves. They will cry out in that time. Revelation 26 Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. So remember before the great dragon who would wage war and he would come and he would destroy. He will face something that you will not. Those of you who know Christ. He will face a torment and a punishment that those who have lived for God and know God and call him Lord will not face. Blessed are and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. So for those who will die and come back, whose lives will end and they will be resurrected, blessed are they because they don't face the second death. So the deadline. What will you do now? With this time you have left, however long you may perceive it or however short you may perceive it, because you don't know the hour nor the day. What will you do with your time? Will your days be totally wrapped up in work and and, and, and the things of, of this world and the accumulation of stuff? Will your life be chasing after God's glory, which includes work? Did you get that? It includes those things. But what do you do first? The book of Revelation admonishes one of the churches by saying, you have forgotten your first love. It recognizes a church that had been on fire for God, that had been there, knew God, 
uh, uh, argued with false teaching, shared the gospel, but they had grown colder and they had begun to forget their first love. They had begun to tolerate false teaching. They had begun to be concerned about how they were perceived by the, the growing culture. But God admonished them and said, you have forgotten your first love. So the question is, what do you live by? Do you live by a you only live once ide- ideology for the young folks that are here and, and, and for those folks who might be savvy enough to know YOLO? You're only, you only live, wor- live once? Do you live by that philosophy that your life is brief, it's a flame, and then it's over? Or do you live by you only die once where Christ is the head of your life? And you live a life that's still brief, it's still a flicker, it's still a flame, but at the end, your death is temporary because you will be with Christ and you will live in eternity, feeling and having that first resurrection and knowing God and living by the light of God, not by the sun or the moon, but by his light, feeling the coolness of the day and being able to walk with God and walk with other believers who have gone ahead of you, who prayed for your souls. Because I know those saints prayed for your souls. It says so in Revelation. It talks about how they had the bowls of incense. And those incense were the prayers of the saints. And yes, that includes your prayer to find your way from Monday to Friday. But it also included Lord, I pray for the generations that will come that know your name, speak your voice and cry out that you are holy. And the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the fathers and the mothers who prayed for their children and their grandchildren and their descendants and said, let my children know you better than I know you. So that their lives would be free from the mistakes that I made. So that they would live lives after your glory from the time that they recognize you until the time that they lay down. Do you only live once or do you only die once? That's the question for you to think about today. The second underline, the rapture. Living Christians are taken away. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, controversial topic. Lots of different ideas. We went into this to a certain degree during Q&A. There's all kinds of ideas around what the rapture looks like, whether there is an actual rapture, whether it's already taken place and we're just kind of living out until Christ's return. No matter what, Understand this, the deadline says that God is going to return with his children. So whether you are on the camp that says we will be caught up and we will disappear, as the Bible says, know that it's something is going to happen and you are going to return with Christ, those who believe. Matthew 24, 39 through 41. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Don't expect to get a tweet or a text message, or a phone call, or carrier pigeon saying prepare because God is on his way and he'll be here in 20 minutes. So you can rush out and try and put your hand to the plow and start talking to that friend that you always wanted to tell about Christ. You will not know. So all the You know, he's coming, and Pastor Paul was like, 88 reasons that Christ is returning in 88, and the Mayan calendar, and the guys a couple years ago that had the big billboards in Baltimore that were like, hey, you know, it's happening, sell all your stuff. You do not know the hour nor the day. 
So live your life in a way that your hand is always to the plow. So no matter where you find yourself, no matter what age you happen to be at, live a life that glorifies God. So if you're a young person and you're in school, whether it's elementary or college, doesn't matter where you find yourself, there is always an opportunity that God is putting in your place. There are people who are around you who need to hear about who God is. That doesn't mean you get your protest sign and you go stand in the middle of the quad and tell people they're going to hell. Okay? I've had that conversation with people. For the most part, it doesn't work. Can people be saved that way? Yes. God can move and he can change hearts and even the worst ideas. But I'm telling you that you will have more success working with the people around you. And that means that sometimes you might meet somebody who's not saved. And that's okay. For the adults, the same thing applies. How awesome is that? It's a very simple thing. Whatever you find yourself doing, make sure your hand is to the plow. So when you're at work, you live a life that honors God. When you're having a pool party, you invite your friends over who might not know. And yes, they're going to say things. They will. They're out that they, they live lives that are outside of God. It's going to happen. And that's okay. My wife and I were talking yesterday as we were driving a, a, about a friend of mine. We were going to visit them. And this friend, we've been friends since college. Freshman year, we met in our very first class. And we have been just rolling together the whole time. And he's cussing like you would not believe. And, hey, that's him. But I still talk to him the same way. Nothing has changed in what I say. It doesn't offend me being a pastor, having a friend who curses. It's okay because that happens. But my conversation to him doesn't go that way. And the things that I share with him aren't that. So what do you do to deal with the people that are around you that offend you? Is your cause to knock them down and hit them over the head with your Bible? As someone who's been on both sides, okay, I've been the antagonistic unbeliever. Okay, it didn't work. That didn't work for me. Okay, it took very slow meth, uh, method, uh, what is that word? Very slow process with God and multiple people who worked with me so that I would come back to the love that I grew up in. And some people, like a, a pastor that I, I've, I've dealt with before, said, um, you know, a guy came up to him and said, hey, we got to have a conversation about Jesus. Do you want it now or later? But that guy was his friend. And he said, look, we're going to have it like that. That's that's the way I look at things now that I'm, uh, you know, people know I'm a pastor. And I'm like, hey, we got to have that conversation about Jesus. Do you want to do it tonight or, you know, you want to schedule it next week? We got to have the we got to have the talk. It's got to happen. I would be remiss as a Christian knowing that the dragon is coming to just let it ride out and not mention it at all. Revelation 16 puts the, 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 the exclamation point on this about God's unexpected return. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Don't get caught off guard is the point. Your hand is to the plow, no matter what. No matter what, you are working and doing what God has called you to do. And their last underline is the reunion. Christians will be with God forever. That is so awesome. We will be with God forever. Can you imagine being with God forever, dwelling in his house, knowing him, having access to him, having his light shine? No more 
loss, no more lack, because God is there. There is no lack in God. When God is there, there is fullness of joy, not happiness. There is fullness of joy. That means that that feeling lasts forever. When there is, where there is God, there is fullness of joy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 through 18. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So what does that mean? That means when we meet each other, remind each other that the Lord comes. When we know that someone is down or someone is hurt or someone is hurting, we go and we talk with them, remind them of who God is, even in their situation. Sometimes that means you just go and you sit and you don't say anything. Because sometimes being with another believer is enough. Encourage one another. Lift one another up. Pastor Paul harps about small groups, and he mentions small groups a lot. I recommend that you come and you be a part. Find one. Get in it. We enjoy time in, my, in our small groups. Even when we're just playing headbands and uh, we're making fun of each other because we can't figure out what's on the headband. Okay? Don't worry about what headbands is. If you come, maybe we'll play one night. But enjoy meeting with each other. So maybe there isn't a small group near you, and that's a concern. You know what? Hey, your house is open, right? It's not something that you do. It's not a Bible study, even though we study the Bible. It's a time to get together and fellowship with each other and just enjoy the the living of God's grace every day. Does that mean that sometimes we dive into a theological topic? Yes. Does that mean that sometimes people bring me pie? Yes. Or Cheerios, which is another one of my favorites. Does that mean that we will go and deliver desserts to someone else's house? Yes. (laughs) So, Find a place that you can connect one to the other. This church will be as successful as we put in the work. Yes, God is here. Yes, his presence is felt. Yes, on a Sunday morning we sing worship and we pray and we say hello to people when they're new and they come through the door. But our church will grow and be successful when we take those natural relationships the people who are around us, the people that we, that we deal with day in and day out, and we begin to infect them and introduce them to Christ. We hang out. We say, you know what? Hey, it's Sunday morning. I know 9 o'clock is early. But hey, we'll be done, and we can go get breakfast when it's over. Sometimes our pastor will go short and not long. See, just to prove you wrong, my last scripture. (laughs) First Corinthians, I knew somebody was going to say it, so I I was waiting. So first Corinthians 15, and this is 51 through 55, comma, 57 through 58. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Our Lord comes, 
and the work you do for him is not in vain. It will not be lost. It will not be tossed onto the ash heap of history. Because you may think, you know what? I've only ever have had someone come to Christ one time. It's only ever happened. I've talked to hundreds of people, and only one person ever answered the call to Christ. But you have no idea what that one person's life will look like. And you have no idea that the hundreds where you watered a seed or you planted a seed that someone else came along later and reaped that harvest. Because at the end of the day, God will get the victory. So if he has done the work in them, his spirit will resonate in them and they will be saved. So really, it's just you doing what you need to do. It doesn't matter whether you're polished or smooth. You don't have to be a sales guy. You don't have to be a person who just gets up in front of people and talks all the time. Because I'll tell you, sometimes sitting at a laptop in a bagel shop, which is what I do, and people come and they sit around me and they don't know who I am, which is great. And somebody will say something and we'll be talking and there'll come that quiet moment where we're just kind of lull in the conversation. So all the small talk is over. All the, hey, did you see that news story yesterday? All the, man, I'm reading about this technology. Let me tell you about what I'm doing right now. Or what kind of work do you do? You can ask serious questions. You can begin to start that work. And people resonate to that because we live in a culture that has, you know, you got your Facebook page and everybody looks at your Facebook page and they watch your statuses and they think they know you. They only know your representative. Because I know for a fact that the Facebook pages I look like is a representative. You're not putting all your stuff online. No matter how much the folks say, oh, well, the teenagers just put everything on the computer and it's all out there. It's not all online. I know people are hurting, and yet everything is wonderful, and I'm posting pictures of kittens and, and, and clouds, and I'm playing the Candy Crush game, and I'm on level 67. Somebody send me some lie. I know there's more going on. Because I played that game, (laughs) literally and figuratively. I lived that. I had the polished veneer of the boy who grew up in church, who sang on the children's choir, who prayed from the giant pulpit in the the, uh, Methodist church that was high and perched up. I did Sunday school. I did VBS. But I also did a lot of other things. And I kept all of that, like, hidden. And then I would see people at my parents' church, and I'd be like, hey, good morning. And they would say, how are you? And I'd say, I'm doing great, when I wasn't. So I don't don't live that way. And I don't say that now as some type of puffed-up thing. It's just that I have to live open now. Because the tendency is in me to hide it, to not let you know when I'm hurting, to not let you know when I'm frustrated, to not let you know when things are wrong, to not let you know when I'm angry. That is the tendency that I have because I like people to like me. I like friends. But if I don't, the dragon is coming. If I don't tell you that God saved me out of my sin, the dragon is coming. And you'll do the same thing that I'm doing. I'll say, how are you doing? You'll say, fine, and we'll go on high five and keep going. But if I tell you that, you know what? I was really frustrated yesterday. I had a conversation with somebody, and it really irritated me. And here's why. Then you can say, well, you know what, Carlton? God says this, or you might not even say God says. You say, you know what, Carlton, it'll be okay. That is how it goes. Sometimes you run into things you don't like, but you remember, God is on the throne, right? We win, right? And I say, yes, you're right, we do win. And it pulls me back. 
to remember who God is. So you're always welcome to do that to me. It's okay. And I hope that it'll be okay when I do that to you. (laughs) Because there will come a time when I will. Please don't be offended. But I am always worried about the souls of the people who are around me. So sometimes I might come off like I'm not sure if you're saved. But don't take it the wrong way. Just remind me that you are. (laughs) And we will hug and we'll say, Maranatha, the Lord comes. We might pray. We might laugh. I might fire up the grill. Who knows? But we're family. And that's what we do. And that's how we'll grow and that's how we'll be successful remembering that Christ returns, that he's real, and that he's risen. Amen. So as the worship team comes forward, I want to pray for the people who are here in the sanctuary with us today, for the people who are watching us online. Like I said, I am always worried about your soul. Your smile is great, but your soul is of is what God wants. That is what is most important. So I want to pray this morning, and as everybody kind of closes their eyes and everybody kind of bows their heads and prepares for prayer, I want to let you know that there is a God who is real, that his presence can be felt, that he is all around, and that he desires your soul. And not your soul in a way that he's just gathering things up, but in that he loves you, he created you, and he wants you to have fellowship eternally with him. So as you prepare to pray, know that God is real. And that he wants you and he desires you. If you're saved this morning and God is real in your life, then your prayer is thank you, God, for pulling me out and for keeping me for however many years he's kept you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I didn't deserve it. I wasn't right. I wasn't right in my head. I wasn't right in my body. I wasn't right in my mind. I was off. But you, God, sent your son to save me. And you can praise God and it's joyful in your heart. For those of you who don't know, might not know God today, know that God came to this earth in the form as Jesus Christ. He was Jesus Christ. He came as a man. He lived a life for you, not for himself, not because he wanted to, but because he wanted you to know God. And he knew that you would not be able to do it on your own. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot do it on your own. Your good works will lead you to the dragon. You will not experience that blessing we talked about earlier. And I know it's hard, and I know it's harsh, and I know it's not nice, and I know it doesn't feel good sometimes, but you know what? It's still true. And I don't want it to be said that anyone that I ever had the opportunity to preach to didn't know that there is a deadline and that God is there. And there's a way for you to know him, to be with him, and to not experience that. So if that's you this morning, if you're at that place where you want to know God to a greater degree, I ask for you to stand and come forward. I know we normally do the close your eyes and put your hand up. I get it. Get up and come forward so that we can pray for you. If you're online right now and you're watching this, I'm with you in prayer right now. Tell God that you want him in your life, that you realize that you are not doing it the right way and that you can't make it but that Jesus died for you and you cry out, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, we need you. And God, we are so grateful for everything that you're doing. 
that you've begun to bring a praise into the hearts of your children this morning, that they can shout and raise their hands and clap because you grabbed them and you knew them and you kept them to yourself. The wedding says that the husband and wife will leave mother and father and cleave to each other, and that's the mystery of how you took us from our parents and took us from our situations and you cleaved us to you so that we could be a part of who you are so that our lives would be chasing after your glory so we have praise in our hearts for you and for those of us who are seeking after you right now that we're chasing you and saying Lord please save me I'm lost and I don't know what to do save them God put your arms around them Pull them to you close. Let them know that you're real. Let them know that you're there. Let them feel your presence. Let it wash over them with power and with glory and with majesty. Let the peace of God begin to work its way into their lives. Let the provision of God begin to take care of their needs. Let the power of God begin to be manifest in their body. Let the healing of God begin to change them on the inside. Because God you are coming and we will not let those around us be lost we will not be that workman who is not prepared whose hands are not to the plow so we pray this morning for all those who come into our contact this week that there would be an opportunity to talk about who you are to share about what we learned on a Sunday morning to share about what we read in our prayer time in our Bible study time to even share that hymn, that song that really touched our heart. And God, we are so grateful for everything that you're doing. For the offering time that will be coming. God, we're excited that you are doing it. That what we give back to you is amazing. And that what you take care of is unbelievable. That we can't imagine how you provide for us. Your provision is a is a wonderful thing. God, we love you this morning. And we need you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
It's offering time, too. I don't have much to say about this. Just remember that this is you giving back to God. A God who said to give me that 10%, to give me that amount that you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a giver who laughs. <laughs> Cheerful, hilarious, a giver who laughs in the giving, knowing that, you know what, sometimes I gave laughing because I'm like, God, I don't know what you're going to do now. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. God meets you where you are. So as you return back to him, you can return back to him with joy, knowing that God is taking care of you and he is also taking care of this house in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.